Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CR Live. It is, of course, Saturday morning. It's 11 a.m. Uh, here in Melbourne. And welcome to the huge number of you that are joining to talk on this very special episode that we're doing this morning to talk about the future of the events industry. This is the Saxton State of Events. Um, and we're going to be talking uh, to you about what's happening in the future. We're going to get some insights from some of the leading experts in our space uh, to talk around where this industry is going and what we need to be doing over the next 12, 18. Wherever you're connecting from, welcome. Um, and also the thing I want to really talk to you about today is this is the best time in history we have ever had to be able to examine what we do, how we do it, and also work with people that we've never worked before. We're going to have to do things that we've never done before in order to be able to get ourselves into the next era that we need for the future of our events industry. We've got a fantastic panel today. I want to share with you uh, who those are before we start. We've got Anne Jamison, uh, the CEO of Saxton. We've got Kelly Maynard from Tourism Australia. We've We've got Nezreen O'Connell there from Cisco. Uh, we've got Stephen Steenson from Reed Exhibitions, Kate Smith uh, from MEA and also the MD of Waldron Smith. We've got Belinda Dury from Salterbeck Events, Nat Simmons from CI Events, Lynn Lewis-Smith uh, from Business Events Sydney. They're all going to be joining us uh, today to talk about the future. We'd also like to get some of your questions. So as we go through today, whichever platform you're on, whether you're on LinkedIn Live, Facebook or YouTube, please do uh, send in your questions and we'll be putting those to the panel members after we've had uh, our initial chats. But here to kick off today, uh, I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you Anne Jamison. And hi, um, obviously crazy times for uh, the speaker bureau world uh, and also speaker management generally. Um, how does the speaker industry have to adapt for the future. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the simple answer is clients will still want an online option, but it will never replace the physical events or gatherings altogether. The online experience will probably augment, it will complement and keep the conversation and brands alive with delegates beyond the event, which is a space that hasn't really been fully explored to its full potential. The online experience gives us a platform to extend an event's life pre and post, delivering greater outcomes for both the organisers and the delegates. So what do we really need to care about? Firstly, I think we'll see a new breed of business leader emerge out of this live stream era. era. People really have needed to pivot really quickly in this space. Um, it's just not about delivering a keynote, a workshop or, or a book, but delivers sort of a radical new experience blending online and offline. There's no question that the two will actually integrate moving forward. Um, there's now a greater opportunity to bundle and set up longer term learnings from a client's perspective. Um, and they'll be seeking more and more information in terms of supporting their teams and their tribes and the community as we come out the other side. We've always considered ourselves to be curators and that won't change as we move online. In fact, we've seen that it's become more and more important with our community as they're reaching out, trying to find their way through COVID-19. I think that um, a bureau will need to extend the impact of the message beyond the initial and from a visibility perspective and help improve the overall brand health and sentiment um, so that they can actually achieve their goals. There's no question that virtual solutions will continue to be part of share, mm. be part of our shared new reality. We have to think differently, be prepared to act differently, and recognise that our industry has industry's future has completely and utterly shifted. That said, we also believe that the power of the human connection is still so incredibly important, and that community is really starting to seek that out. You know, not design. The events industry is seeing decades of progress in a space of months, which leads mm. to, uh, I think, will lead to a more sustainable, a more creative landscape in which corporate events will exist. And it's fascinating to hear you, Anne, reaffirming the need for human connectivity there. Um, thanks very much. Kelly, going on to yourself uh, from Tourism Australia, um, you're head of distribution and development there and partnerships. And um, actually, most people might not even know that you spent about 10 years at CI events uh, in both China uh, and Australia. You've also been in the hotel industry. How does, in your role now as Tourism Australia, how, does, how do you and your organisation uh, support the industry going forwards? Uh, and also from an international perspective, what will Tourism Australia be doing? 
Yeah, thanks, Chris. And I think, you know, my um, experience in, in event management and in other roles really does help, uh, you know, me in my role at, at Tourism Australia and Business Events um, Australia. So I think our key focus, you know, firstly acknowledging it's super tough times and really unprecedented for our industry here in Australia, but also our customers in our key international markets. And that's, as Tourism Australia, our focus really is to, you know, increase consideration of Australia and to to market Australia internationally and for business events, uh, that's us getting that, um, you know, consideration and keeping Australia front of mind, which, uh, you know, in these tough times has been interesting. So we are, you know, in an industry that's all about relationships. Uh, it's about us continuing to market. So we've kept our marketing going in our key international markets during this time while our customers are, you know, dreaming and, and thinking about their, their future events. And I think um, the main consideration really for us is monitoring sentiment in those markets. Tourism Australia is, is monitoring, um, you know, what the consumer sentiment is for travel and we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. But for business events, it's really about um, our teams in market engaging with, with the customers uh, while some of our activity distribution is parked for the moment. We're continuing our marketing. We're looking at recovery uh, plans that will help support the industry from a marketing and distribution perspective and um, it's really us that can support industry here as our business events bid fund, um, which is a subvention program to help industry that bid for international events to win our uh, business. And we know that's going to be super important in a com competitive uh, international environment. So, you know, the convention bureaus mm. work with us uh, on that. And also our advanced program, which is, you know, providing financial support for industry to, you know, help with marketing and distribution activities that you might need support on. And also yep. looking at delegate boosting for upcoming international events because we know that's going to be hard work when events, you know, do resume travel. Yeah. And Kelly, you touched on consumer sentiment there with travel. Have we seen anything um, pattern-wise starting to emerge around what consumers are considering, either from a leisure or a corporate perspective when it comes to travel? I think from a consumer perspective, obviously, every international market is different. Um, you know, we can see China certainly starting to resume some level of business as usual. You know, corporate customers in China are back at work, mm. event agencies some are. So I think, you know, there's different um, levels of, you know, wanting to start planning and thinking about travel and events in, in international markets. New Zealand, you know, potentially is our next opportunity with talk of an Australia-New Zealand, you know, travel bubble. Yep. I think for business events, the one thing that's certainly an advantage for us is that Australia has been perceived really well internationally to how we've handled the virus, uh, which is difficult because it's hard for us to market that. Mm. But we know safety and security, you know, is a key focus in risk planning, certainly for events. But I think, you know, that's probably the most positive sentiment is we know events will resume. We just don't know, obviously, you know, around social distancing and borders mm. opening some of those challenges. Australia has certainly been uh, absolutely. Well. Thanks, Kelly. And uh, on to you, uh, Nezreen O'Connell from Cisco. You're a, a very well-known name within the uh, industry. In fact, there were some discussions going on about Cisco uh, and the events that um, you had to migrate Cisco Live online just a, a few weeks back. Um, you've been at Cisco for 12 years now, and this is unprecedented. I hate to use that word. It's one of the most overused words that we've got at the moment, but we're in crazy times. And what's, what's the response you've seen from from moving from Cisco Live physical into that online world? Is it viable? Is it even realistic going ahead? Yeah, look, we've always had a virtual component to our physical events. So we've always run our annual user conference physically, and we've always streamed live to a virtual audience. So we transitioned, as you mentioned, the flagship event to a virtual environment fully in April, and we thought it'd be really important to continue the conversation with our customers and our partners. Uh, what was important to us was actually to focus on who was going to be watching online, who was going to spend two days with us or part of that time, mm. and then really thinking about the agenda and changing that to modify it to those that we're going to be watching online. We knew we weren't going to get everyone that was at the physical event can Committing to a two-day virtual conference. Um, we had incredible reach um, and majority of the people that watched online had never been to a physical Cisco Live. So from that perspective, it was incredible to see the reach that we got and to obviously continue that knowledge and education and sharing. Um, we had ex great exposure from that front. Um, mm. What the physical event provides was depth 
spending yeah. four days with people, mm. personalizing the content, understanding their buying cycles, um, the touching, the feeling and the hearing, actually spending more time in areas that were interest to you at the time. Mm. Um, so the user experience for us and what we've learned is it has to change. No longer can we run a physical event and then decide what we're streaming virtually. The virtual import, um, audience is incredibly important and we have to really focus on what the live part of that virtual experience is going to look like for them. So for us, the planning of a physical event needs to now go hand in hand with the virtual experience and mm. not think about what were we doing at the physical event that we were streaming, but actually be part of the virtual um, experience from the very beginning of our planning cycle. And when you're going into, Nesri, when you're planning now physical events in the future, um, say into next year, what are the things now that are different for you as far as even things like risk that you've got to uh, take into account, which you perhaps didn't have to do before? I mean, because Cisco is a massive worldwide brand. This isn't just about you being able to uh, run an event here locally in Australia. You've got a, a big... There. Yeah, we're working with teams that we've never worked with before internally to the level of detail that we're working with them. We're working with all of the event teams globally. We're a lot closer to the corporate headquarters around yeah. what that's going to look like. And really, to be honest, a lot of best practice sharing from the teams that are now transitioning. You know, we're learning from each other. We're learning from the industry. And we've got a lot to share based on our experiences. So, yeah, the world looks completely different. Um, The exhibition space has been incredibly uh, impacted, probably one of the biggest spaces to be impacted in the events industry. Things are really different now for you guys. How do you as an exhibition business pivot in a space like this, in this type of era? What are you guys doing? Very start of, um, of the process through this experience where we're, we're fortunate enough to be already working in the, uh, the virtual aspects of our events um, for some years now. Uh, monetize that and how we bring that into a greater value. Um, but uh, through this process, it's really clearly identified to us the importance of actually being complementary to the um, the delivery of the events. Um, there is no um, there's no uh, argument that face to face has a value. Um, in the sectors that we work in, there is uh, an excitement in the passion of the exhibitor who can mm. master pick someone out of the highway and show their, their product or their, their services. Mm. Um, trying to do that virtually is, 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 is not the same, but at the same time, the, the five days or the three days of an event, it can be supported for the other 360 days with the value and, and what would have to be quality um, content that is driven from the event in a virtual perspective. I know that to read exhibitions, I mean, you guys do some massive expos. Uh, you're very well known for them. Uh, August, you've still got uh, a giftware exhibition uh, that's planned um, and you're still proceeding for that to happen. In fact, that's due, like I said, in August. Um, what's your thoughts around timings for that? Is that? Do you feel that's still viable and realistic to be, to be looking at an event in August in a convention centre? Well, if we go back uh, some eight, nine weeks ago, we were uh, privileged to be part of a couple of the, the meetings that were taking place in one of Victoria for Creative Victorian uh, Minister. And the timeline of the curve really helped identify to us of what could be realistic. Um, time's ticking, though. Um, mm. where we're two weeks out to a trade guide deadline. We're two weeks out to registration launch. And we're two weeks out to um, our marketing campaign. Um, so for us, we need um, certainty. We need assurances and we need some sort of direction. And I think from the exhibition um, landscape, everybody is looking for some timeline to work to. Yeah. Um, suppliers are leading their decisions which could determine whether they're going to be around long term or not. Um, and, and likewise, other organisers mm -hmm. uh, have moved all their shows into the third and fourth quarter. Um, so August is really the kickstart of that. Um, but as I said, you know, we can't find out on the 25th of July that I could run an event on the 1st of August. Mm -hmm. We need that, that eight to, to 12 week campaign to, to, to deliver it. Um, we don't have exhibitors or, um, or planning just sitting on the shelf ready to go um, and flip the switch. It, it takes a lot of focus and a lot of effort to get that to where it needs to be. So time is of the essence from, from our perspective. 
Thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, we're already getting a whole heap of questions coming through from you or guys all watching uh, online. Keep them coming. We will come to those uh, in just a few minutes' time uh, for our panel members here. Um, uh, Kate Smith, MEA, and uh, Waldron Smith. Uh, you're the managing director, in fact, of Waldron Smith. Um, we heard Stephen there talking about timescales, and everyone's trying to find out and guess where uh, we're going to start seeing some of this come back to life, the industry. Um, from an MEA perspective, what What's the foreseeable future look like when it comes to um, domestic uh, and national events? Thanks, Chris. Well, certainly from Mayor's perspective, a lot of our time since this has unfolded has been spent uh, working on the advocacy component, mm. um, talking through to government both on a state but also on a federal level. Yep. Federally, um, we work through the Business Events Council of Australia. Um, along with other industry bodies, there are five groups in that that has the one voice through to government, which is really important to inform them of what it is that we need, the framework we need as a first response, but also a recovery. Um, touching on, uh, there's still work to be done, a lot of work to be done in that space, but just picking up on some of the things Steve mentioned too, some of the issues we've been able to highlight to government is to get an understanding of our industry, the lag time that we need. Um, if restrictions are released, we can't open up next week. Um, mm. It can be up to six, 12 uh, weeks, 12 months before we're ready to take an event to market. So there is that awareness around that. Um, we all want to meet safely. Mm. So industry through Becca, again, has put together some initial guidelines. And the safety component doesn't just apply to the venue. It has to apply through the whole supply chain. So, again, trying to inform government what will work for industry is really important. And I think the, the major point we're trying and message we're trying to get through to government too is the differentiation between business events and a mass gathering. Yep. Uh, we are different to a football match or a concert. We have measures available to us that we can really manage our audiences uh, mm. safely, which is obviously paramount for our clients and their stakeholders, but also for our own people as well. So that advocacy piece that I know our association and our industry is working mm. so hard on is obviously, um, you know, paramount to getting this industry restarted again. And as a member organisation also, um, what from an MEA perspective, what are you doing there to help uh, keep the industry connected and, and moving forwards? Look, it's really important, Chris, and, and from our client base, we work in the association market. So mm. I see it from um, our client's perspective as well as wearing the MIA hat as such. Yep. Uh, connection is really important at this time. This has happened so swiftly to our mm. industry too that um, I think we're going through different stages um, of it. Uh, and what our members need from us, I think, will change as we progress through the, the process. Um, Understanding, having those conversations with what they need from us now may well change. What can we take to market swiftly that mm. can assist them in this time? Um, you know, there's a proliferation of webinars, but yep. MIA has designed a series that are, are very much focused around making our people and our businesses future fish for when we're able to come back to business. So, again, what can we bring to market on that side? What can we adapt? Mm. Um, and really just having those connections. At the same time, looking at what we need to be in the future. Our world mm. will be different when we come out of this. And as an industry association, how do we become and remain relevant to our members? What will our members' needs be beyond yep. this? Um, so there's a lot of forward planning in that mix as well. Thanks very much, Kate. Uh, Belinda, on to you as the GM of Salterbeck. We've heard so much there, even from Kate, talking around change in the future. It's going to be a different industry uh, coming out of this. I think that's almost uh, a given now that we're all recognising that. What's the road back for the incentives part? I mean, incentives is an enormous part uh, of the events industry. How do you see the future uh, panning out for that? Yeah, so incentives, like every other meeting or event type, the original reason the incentive existed is still there. Yeah. But unlike many event types, it can't go 100% virtual. Uh -huh. So at the moment, organisations and agencies are looking for different ways and new ways to deliver the same goals, but in a new environment. Uh -huh. So that might be a combination of virtual or hybrid events, but more likely it's going to be a scaled down version to meet the current restrictions. In the incentive space, it's going to react much longer than uh, the business event space because okay. many incentives are based on international locations yeah. um, 
and and things like that. So looking at ways to scale down an event so it's smaller mm. and doing rotational events and things like that. So incentives are in for a, a long road ahead of them, but there are ways of doing it, particularly on domestic shores. And do you think the long road ahead for the incentives industry is because of the travel restrictions that we're going to see from corporates and businesses, or is it more government-wide restrictions that we're going to have to adhere to? I think that it is government and travel restrictions, Mm. but also it's our own appetite for risk and what people are going to want to, you know, go into moving forward. I think that the events industry as a whole, particularly those that have a strategic program, Mm. the industry is going to come back to its old volumes, but it will never go back to the way that it was and our perception of risk has significantly changed. So we have to factor how comfortable people are doing different activities as we move forward with the recovery. Thanks very much, Belinda. And on to you, Nat, uh, the GM here for uh, CI events in Australia, arguably uh, one of the top tier events experience companies there is. Uh, I mean, the world has changed beyond recognition almost. Um, What do you see the future playing out for uh, the events industry when it comes to experiences and how do we rebuild? Thanks, Chris. Um, Thanks for having me. I think that for us, um, you know, and somebody reminded me of this quote just last week saying, um, you know, in Churchill's quote, actually, which is don't let any good crisis go to waste. And I think for us and the way that we've been approaching what's going to happen post-COVID is really to be brave. And I think Mm. for our industry now is the time to truly, truly be brave because, you know, the world of yesterday is not going to be the world of tomorrow. We all know that. Every, everybody who you've heard speak this morning has said the same thing. But I do think it gives us an opportunity to create something fairly special. Mm. I think the divergence of, you know, virtual and in-person events um, is really, really important. And I think that what potentially the biggest opportunity is um, is around content and content creation. And Anne actually alluded to this right at the beginning, is that rather than looking at events as a single moment in time, because we will be looking at offline and online, it gives us an opportunity to really um, create a much larger halo effect for mm. events and really think about the strategic approach when we are talking virtually, followed by an in-person experience, followed by some more virtual experiences, um, to build something that, you know, before you'd, kind of have the pre-coms of an event for a few weeks and you'd have the event and you'd have a bit of post-coms. And usually we say it's about a six to eight week halo effect. Mm-hmm. Whereas we really believe now that building the right content, the relevant content, being brave about how we deliver that content and engage with people, what technologies we start to introduce, which we potentially hadn't introduced before, we could see about a six to nine month run rate which is a huge amount of return on investment, um, you know, from our customers' perspective and their audiences, whether that's internal um, employees or, you know, the consumer base of who they're trying to engage with. So I think there will definitely be a huge shift. But for us, probably what has been the most exciting thing to see is, you know, we've been doing some of our own webcasts for the last about 10 to 12 weeks now, um, is the conversations that are coming Mm. forward actually off those webcasts and really our um, customers are really wanting to have different conversations. They want to be having those braver conversations of how to do things differently and how to, you know, put what they stand for in the Mm. centre of their content and how they move forward post this COVID-19 world. So I actually think there's a lot of exciting conversations and a lot of exciting green shoots that once we are allowed to travel and connect more, Mm. are starting to pop through already. And that's a really good uh, segue into my next question for you. In fact, we've got one that's coming online, so I'm kind of jumping the gun here and throwing you uh, in the deep end, Nat, already. Uh, We've had a question come through from the Archie Team Cooperative saying, do we have any idea what the consumer behaviour will be like once the restrictions have been lifted? I mean, have we got any insights into that? What does that look like? Yeah, I think it will vary um, from the... Um, quite significantly between the SME market and the large market um, corporates that we work with on a general um, rule because I do feel that, you know, all companies have a risk management policy. All companies want to look after their employees. All companies want to look after their consumers. 
But I think that when we look at SMEs and when, you know, hopefully Australia will follow suit um, very quickly after New yep. Zealand of allowing events 100, I think that that will allow SMEs to really start to have different conversations very, very quickly. Whereas I feel that large market will take a lot longer because I think there's, you know, there's different legalities, there's different processes, mm. there's different um, appetites for risk. And I think also it's going to be a little bit of a mixture because as an individual, you know, and as an employee, do I want to go to a conference or a meeting yeah. versus a company allowing me to go? Right. And so I think there's still a little bit of uncertainty of, What's going to be the individual sentiment versus the customer sentiment to yep. actually hold the Thanks, Nat. Um, and on to you, Lon, uh, sorry, Lynn Lewis-Smith, uh, the CEO of Business Events Sydney. We've heard uh, words like risk. We've heard about human, about connectivity, uh, experiences and online. And um, for destination management, what does the future look like uh, in this space now for you guys? Well, certainly an interesting time, Chris, there's no doubt. Um, if you look at the Convention Bureau model uh, and the way that we are structured here in Australia, many are part of the government um, tourism organisations and some like Business Events Sydney are not-for-profit that um, are funded by the public and private sector. Uh, I think the future focus of um, and a sustainable model for us is one that's aligned with economic development and that we're driving not only the visitor economy but also the knowledge and innovation economies. And I think we're going to be seen as very much part of the strategic recovery for our destinations, um, which is incredibly important. Mm. Uh, the market has changed incredibly. Um, I'm not sure... I think we might have lost her uh, there for a second. We'll continue uh, and come back uh, to Lynn Lewis-Smith in a second. We've got heaps of questions um, coming through uh, as I'm having a look through them now. I'm going to go to um, Kate, back to you. We've got a question here um, from Petter Moore. The Events Safety Alliance in the US has released a guide, a reopening guide. It's a really comprehensive 30-page document. Um, the question here is, could MEA provide something like that for the Australian? Australian industry. Is that something you guys would consider or are already working on? Um, Chris, we are looking at it. I think at the moment um, there's some initial work that we've done um, and there's lots of um, elements that we need to bring into play. Uh, for Mia's perspective, we see that very much as one of the offerings we can take to market. Um, but at the moment, it seems to be very centric around venues and we need to make it a lot broader than that. It's everyone that will come into contact with that, that guest through that uh, experience of the event. So it is something we're looking at. There are guidelines also from groups like Safe Work Australia, but we need ones that are specific to our industry and what that, that experience is going to be like. We're certainly looking to um, examples of what's happening overseas, but certainly um, from a local level. And we also have the challenge, of course, that some of the state uh, regulations will be different to a federal guideline. So we need to look at that as well in terms of what we can offer. And it's all about building that consumer confidence to come back and, mm. and play in our space. Mm -hmm. Kate, thank you very much. Um, Anne, I'm going to throw this next question um, over to you and put you uh, in the deep end here. Um, we've had a question come through from Stuart Jones asking, how do we monetize online events? I mean, this is a, a quite a big discussion point that's going around now. Speakers uh, are also looking uh, to this. What's the opportunities you see there to be able to monetize? How do we do it? Uh, and also, how realistic do you think uh, the future of online events is from a speaker management agency? So from a monetizing perspective, like from a speaker's perspective, when they're actually doing their work and everything, preparing to do, whether it's a live keynote or virtual keynote, the amount of time, resources and all the work that they need to do, Chris, is exactly the same. Yeah. So you're actually still accessing um, business leaders' IP. You're still accessing their potential keynote or if it's a workshop or whatever that might look like. Um, you know, clients are saving money because they don't have to pay for travel, that yeah. type of thing. So 
the way to monetize it is 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 to not um, sort of undervalue the IP of what you're actually delivering to the client. So yeah. we're seeing that we're still maintaining relatively high levels in terms of pricing. Yeah. Um, I look, sometimes, you know, there's not-for-profits out there and things like that yeah. that really need help during this time. And so, you know, they might say, look, I've got a really small budget, can you help? And so all that means is instead of doing a an hour keynote, you might do a 10-minute keynote based yeah. on what is available from a budget perspective. And I think this isn't about also just reducing feed uh, to be able to have that race down to the bottom. It's about maintaining your fee and then building value and stacking that value back on top, which you talked about uh, earlier. Um, I've just been told that we've got Lynn back uh, online. Um, we're dealing with all sorts of uh, technical, cool stuff in our world here and uh, the challenges that go with that with a live event like this. Uh, Lynn, welcome uh, back um, for the destination space. Did you want to continue on your sharing your thoughts there? Chris, I'm not sure where I left off, so I'm not sure what the audience heard first off. Um, we last we just lost you after about your second sentence. There, it was pretty early on. <laughs> okay. Um, And I think we might have lost Lynn again. We'll come back to her in a second. Um, we've got a couple of questions for Lynn there coming through uh, as well. Um, I've also got um, some other ones called, I've got Paula Roundtree. Um, I might throw this one um, to uh, yourself, um, Nat. Um, Paula has been asking, in light of a potential day to international borders opening, confidence in international travel, um, what's the future when it comes to a domestic market here? Where do we really see uh, our events industry being able to rebuild um, when it comes to, to travel? Um, I think that Sorry, and I think I got the question right, Chris, but it's obviously with international borders being shut, what's domestic travel yeah, going we're, to we're, look like? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, once... I'm not so sure it's actually down to the borders so much. I actually think it's down to just physically being able to meet because I think as, as soon as people are able to meet, even if, you know the Queensland government decides that they're not going to open their borders um, till September is obviously now what's being raised. Um, I think that if New South Wales and Victoria, WA, whatever it is, um, said, okay, we, we could have events for 100 in two mm. weeks' time, I think that companies would kick into action um, and to start to really engage in whatever domestic market mm. um that we are allowed to engage in. I think at the end of the day, you know, human connection is... You can't replace it, right? So I think that as soon as people are allowed to do that and as soon as companies really assess their appetite for risk and what mm. they consider is critical versus a nice to have um, and really weigh all the different options up, yeah. I think that we'll see domestic travel open up really, really quickly. And if it's in one state, it will be in one state. If it's across yeah. multiples, I think companies will capitalise on that. I think Do you think just, that... On switch. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you think that smaller companies uh, are going to be a little, because we always talk about small companies being innovative, they're able to pivot quicker. In this era that we're in, Nat, with your experience with clients and events of all shapes and sizes, do you think smaller companies are going to have a bigger appetite for risk um, when it comes to events? And is this, uh, if we look at the larger, big international companies, are they going to be a little bit more cautious when it comes to um, putting people in? a room from a legal perspective and the implications of that what's your view on on how that might pan out yeah i think we're already talking to customers who are headquartered out of the us and there's definitely more um you know more of kind of a no we're not doing this until you know we're not even reassessing certain things till december we're not you know one company you know, yesterday was we're not actually having allowing any face to face meetings of any kind, even in an office, until July of next mm. year, of 2021. Um, whereas I do think that there are, yes, I think that smaller companies um, have the opportunity to probably run events a little bit differently. They can yeah. be more agile in their approach. I don't think, well, I would, I would hate to think that any company, and I can't imagine that this would be, you know, 
I know that I would never want to put my own people at risk. Mm. So I think, um, you know, the risk assessment, is, I think, will become a standard whether you're a small business or a large business. Mm. But definitely, I think large corporations, publicly listed corporations, global corporations have a whole lot of other legal issues to deal with um, than you might see in a smaller company where, you know, it's easier to put 25 people in a space, right? Um, and it's totally. probably easier to manage, yeah. Um, our risk is going to be a very different thing going ahead. I mean, we've always had risk analysis done uh, in some way, shape or form. I mean, Australia has never been immune to uh, things like flooding and, uh, and natural events that have happened that have impacted our events industry. It's just I see now we're going to take such a, a deeper uh, dive when it comes to uh, risk management and analysis going forwards for events. Um, let's go back and try with Lynn again, because Lynn, we've got a, a question for you from uh, the audience. Um, what changes will BES be making to support the domestic market or will your focus remain on funding international events uh, post-COVID? Yeah, good question. Everyone's um, asking that about convention bureaus around the world that haven't been in the domestic market, which traditionally we haven't. It's been the international market. Um, but we see an opportunity to support our supply chain, the visitor economy supply chain, um, in terms of marketing Sydney and New South Wales as a business events destination and supporting, um, you know, those stakeholders that are wanting to drive business when the domestic market opens up, which I don't think is going to be too far um, away, given that New Zealand has now taken gatherings of around 100. If that goes well, then I think that we're in good stead here in Australia to, to reopen the, the, the market and the borders. Um, internationally, we will still, that's our key purpose, is to um, add value and create value for clients mm. and drive incremental value and not duplicate the effort of our supply industry. I think what we're going to have to do as um, marketing and management organisations is really innovate and think about the digital and technological application and the pain points of our customer journey and how we can create value for them. And I think that's a big change in terms of this virtual world. It's not going to go away. It's heightened. It's going to be a very hybrid world that we operate in from here on. And I think um, looking at how the markets are going to open up domestic, international will be more corporate in terms of the bubbles that we as Australia decide to open up to. And then global meetings, I think we've got a fair way to go because you've got delegates coming from 100 um, different locations and you would need, you know, a surety with a vaccine for people to get on planes and, and fly in the next, you know, 18 months to two years. So really interesting times ahead, but innovation needs to be at the forefront, R&D, yep. um, all our businesses right now. Um, thanks very much, Lynn. We've got heaps of questions. I'm trying to choose the, uh, the best ones. They're all great. Um, I've got one for you. Back to you, Kate, uh, now. Um, we're, this is a, message, a question here from Nicole Robertson. Can we hear from Kate in regards to registration fees uh, being charged for online events? What's the uh, position that you've got there from MEA? Uh, look, Mia probably doesn't have a position on that, but let me put on my Walton Smith hat on yeah. that, if I may. Um, look, for me, it, it's new territory in, in mm. many respects. Um, as Lynn touched on before, we have all focused so heavily on the face-to-face -face because that's the true value. And our virtual component has really been a minimal part of our industry, um, whereas now the, the scales are tipping mm. and we're, we're needing to respond fairly quickly. And I think um, to a point earlier too, there's almost an education process for our clients that we need to go through as to what the possibilities are in that hybrid space. It's not just a matter of picking up that same product and, and putting it on a Zoom platform. It comes back to our conference design yeah. and we will design conferences differently knowing there is going to be a hybrid mix, what yeah. the experience will be face-to-face -face versus the virtual. So when it comes to registration fees, I'm not sure anyone's got the uh, the mm. right formula or knows a, f a foolproof formula, but I think we will all have to be brave enough to take that to market, depending on the demographic and the sector that we're dealing in. Um, and it will be a learning process, I think, too. We need to, as I said, educate our clients as to what it can look like, but then also look at it in terms of the monetising of it. Yeah. It will be an additional cost, but 
the, the legacy and longevity of that content opens it up to a different audience altogether. So there's great opportunity in that mix too. Uh, so I don't have an exact answer as to what the right formula mm. is, but it does need to be monetized, absolutely. Thanks, Kate. Um, back to you, uh, Stephen. We talked the other day about fees um, being a thing with physical events, with exhibitions. Um, things are changing from, from your side, uh, even the convention centers and how they charge. And from a fee perspective, uh, they've got to re-examine this. Fees is a massive topic for, for all parts of this industry. There's no doubt. The question that I want to put to you now, um, and this will go to a few of the panel members, is looking forwards into the future, so beyond some stuff like fees, beyond risk, um, what are the skills and talent changes that we're going to uh, see change within the events industry? What are the kind of shifts that we're going to see new uh, skills required and new talent? Well, I think it all aligns to the, um, the, the topic at hand of the, of the virtual and technology aspects that are included into our events. Um, I think the landscape, um, you know, the social distancing is not going to go away for a long time, so that's going to be yeah. part of what we do. The key for us is how we bring in um, an experience that is, is not um, one that's going to make the, uh, the attendee or the participant feel that it's not uh, valuable or that it's, it's, a, it's a poor experience. So how we bring the technology into that, how we change the way we do registration, how mm -hmm. we change the way we interact and meet um, buyer and seller. Um, we're already a long way down the track in doing some of those things from, from a read perspective, but yep. that will be the norm across uh, pretty much all of our customers um, and all of the organisers that, that hold events, I feel. Thanks, uh, Stephen. I also want to ask that question to you, Nazreen, as a, a leader from an uh, events um, hosting organisation um, that does do online already and does the physical and blends those two together. This is, despite all of that and in spite of all of that, we're in a completely new era. What do you see as a skill set change from within the events industry, not just from a talent and a speaker perspective, but from the core of the events industry? Where do you see skills demand? Um, having to change? Yeah, digital marketing is definitely a massive partner of ours now in Chelling at Cisco. They've always been a partner, uh, even more importantly now that we've moved into that virtual environment. You know, we put so much emphasis when we're organising physical events on the touch points, the surprise and delight, the um, experience, the journey, the pre-event, the on-site, the post-event. How do you transition that into the virtual experience yeah. and how do you still continue to surprise and delight in that online journey? And with that, the technology is incredibly important, but I think there's a huge amount of opportunity and innovation um, that needs to be focused on about how you still get or mirror certain elements of that experience versus it being one-way traffic into a video environment. How do you offer other varieties of interaction and networking in that online world? Thanks, Nazreen. Um, I've got more questions coming in. This, in fact, is going to be uh, the last one before we start to wrap up. Uh, I'm going to put this to you, Anne, um, the CEO of Saxon and the person that pulled this state of events uh, online discussion uh, together. Um, what I mean, you used to be the marketing director for the um, Melbourne Convention Centre before you stepped into your uh, your role now as CEO of Saxon. So you've got a, a good perspective from both sides uh, of the fence, as it were. When do you think we're going to see, I mean, crystal balling here, when do you think we're going to see numbers larger than 100 uh, for events? And we're completely going to hold you to this. Um, so whatever you say now is going to be locked and loaded uh, into the uh, history books. <laughs> right, uh, next week. <laughs> <laughs> Um, please. It's done. Um, there we go. That's the end of the event. Uh, Anne Jamison said we're going back uh, next week into normal flow. Look, I think, uh, you know, sort of, I think everybody's touched on a little bit today. I think everybody's really going to be looking to New Zealand now that they're allowed to yeah. have meetings with people and more and what, and what that looks like. I think that, um, you know, delegates are going to be very cautious about actually mm. attending an event. You know, there's going to be this heightened level of sort of people feeling insecure about going out and potentially catching COVID-19. Yeah. I think that there's still an enormous amount of work 
um, and I'm sort of generalising here a little bit, um, venues, but I think there's still probably an enormous amount of work to be done at a government level and at a venue and supplier levels in terms of what that looks like so events can actually get back. And I know that there's a whole lot of work going on within the community around that. And I know, you know, that needs to be pushed up to government and government needs to say, you know, you're good to go. Um, I think probably I would love to see maybe before the end of the year we go from 100 maybe to 300 and then as we step into the new year, um, you know, maybe up to 500. I think one of the things that Becca is doing a great piece of work on at the moment, Chris, is mm. really letting government know that business events is not a, like a mass gathering. It's not like a concert. It's not like a, yeah. a festival. We can apply all sorts of certain controls to make sure that we can manage the social distancing and everything. So I think that there's an opportunity for the business events industry, whether that's corporate or associations, uh, to actually start to get back together. But I think initially, you know, 50 to 100, maybe 300, and if that goes well, 500, and then probably halfway through next year towards the back end of next year, larger events. Thanks, and I'm also going to throw in another question here, but I am going to put this one to Belinda. There's so many really good ones coming. Uh, I want to get this one out there. Um, this one question is from Shelley um, for you, Belinda. Looking into the future and specifically with international conferencing, do you think that Australia is going to come out of this ahead of the game? I mean, if we look at the GFC when that happened, it feels like that was only uh, yesterday that um, Australia um, came out of the GFC, and we didn't even do that badly out of it compared to some of the other countries in the world. I mean, if you then take that model and apply that to where we are today with the events industry, do we think Australia is going to come out fair better uh, the, with this than other countries in the world? I, I do think that we will. Um, I think that Australia, the events industry, from all of the people that you've spoken of today, the events industry has responded in a quick, effective and efficient manner. And we have controls that have been put into place to make sure that we can continue to manage the situation as best as possible. I think that organisations are looking very much not to cancel their activities, mm. but to move them from offshore to onshore because there is a perceived lower risk with remaining onshore in Australia. And that will also be our benefit in the long term when other markets across the globe start mm. to open their international travel, Australia will be perceived as a very safe destination to come to. So we'll be one of the first to rebound for inbound visitors as well. Thank you so much. Um, I am also now going to uh, shamelessly take this opportunity to thank the incredible people uh, that have not only helped make this studio a reality out of a crazy idea uh, that I had um, just seven or eight weeks ago, the team from Show Division uh, helping to bring this studio uh, to life. Thank you so much to Jason Thetford, uh, to Linton Galatley, and also to Kieran McCrory. You guys have been absolutely fabulous. And I couldn't have done any of this uh, without you. Also, thank you to the Saxon and wonderful team led by Anne and Emma McDowell um, for putting this on event this event together uh, it's been fantastic to really get some discussion going on and it's going to continue beyond uh, this event here today there's heaps more questions I couldn't get to um, we'll certainly make sure that we get some of that uh, back to you if any of you want to watch this event online afterwards we'll be sending out the links uh, to uh, give you that so you can share it within your communities uh, also and thank you very much to, to my team my director of photography, uh, Andrew uh, Ware, and also thank you to Dorothy Lotoro, uh, who's been managing and going through all the questions that you guys have been doing today. And finally, last but not least, thank you to the amazing panel uh, that we've had. Thank you uh, for sparing your time and all the pre-checks and the discussions that we've had over the last week. Uh, we certainly couldn't have done this without you at all. It's the most critical discussion we have ever had uh, and come together for as the events industry. And my hope is that we will come together and do stuff in a way that we have never ever done before as an industry. This is absolutely without doubt the best time that we have ever had uh, to examine everything about our businesses, our industry, and how we can ultimately lift the game when it comes to client Because that's what we're all about. Incredible.
do to help make this all a reality. And I look forward, as all of you do, to getting back uh, to a real world of physical touch, feel and sensor. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being a part of our very special uh, insight series today uh, with, in partnership with Saxon uh, for the state of events. Have a great rest of your week. Oh, oh, oh.